from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, a timeline develops for the House version of the Farm Bill. The wheat tour wraps up and yield expectations disappoint. In agribusiness, staying calm in bumpy cattle markets. The, the cattle on feed reports for six or seven months have illustrated we've got bigger supplies coming. The market knows this. It's what's held us back a little bit. And learning about the carbon penalty from cover crops. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full-size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Congress is on recess this week, but the chairman of the House Ag Committee says by mid-May, he expects the farm bill to be ready for the floor of the House. Next week will spend the time uh, running traps with my uh, Republican colleagues to make sure we've got the votes necessary. Uh, it's unfortunate that my Democrat uh, friends have gone to the sidelines, but that's their choice. Uh, I think I can get this done with just Republicans, and so that's the direction we're going to go, and we'll shore that up next week, and then uh, the plan is to be on the floor the following week. That's Chairman Mike Conaway speaking exclusively to Chip Flory on AgriTalk Thursday. Now the same day, the Congressional Budget Office releasing its latest analysis of the Farm Bill. It puts the overall price tag at $868 billion. Now that's from fiscal year 2019 through 2028. The CBO expecting price loss coverage safety net payments to go up $400 million, while ag risk coverage or ARC payments will fall $300 million. That's just one of the changes the House bill makes in the new legislation. 52% drop in net farm income over the last five years. Chapter 12 bankruptcies are up 33% over the last two years alone. The struggles of farm country finances front and center as the House passes a farm bill out of committee. But the 26 to 20 party line vote was anything but bipartisan. Mr. Chairman, uh, this is a flawed bill, and it's a result of a bad and non-transparent process. The ag side, or Title I of the bill, does what many hoped, maintains the safety net programs. The overall goal for a farm bill is a bill that provides an appropriate safety net uh, for farmers, not that they farm for a program, but they farm for the market forces, but when all the vagaries of weather, pests and insects and floods and droughts and all those things come, then that producer can have an opportunity to uh, do it again next year, hoping always for a better crop. ARC and PLC remain, but the new bill uses agricultural marketing service data rather than data from NAS to determine payments. The change designed to reduce a wide gap in payments between neighboring counties. But the NAS data uh, is, is not as robust in some areas of the country, particularly where certain you know, crops may be relatively new. It also includes the recent changes for cotton and a rewrite of the Dairy Margin Protection Program. I don't think there's a single person in ag circles that would tell you that cotton and dairy weren't the, the commodities with the poorest safety net. CRP acres will stair step higher, up to 29 million, but rental rates will go down with the House's proposal. That's been one of the complaints we've certainly heard a lot about, particularly from young farmers and ranchers, that the ability to take on new land or the ability to get started in agriculture, they're competing against the CRP program. And so if you can get those rental rates uh, lined up a little more fairly in terms of cash rental rates, that might help uh, open that door a little bit. Conservation programs will also be consolidated with a focus on EQIP. It also makes an investment in animal health and a massive vaccine bank. Republicans on the committee also rolled in a package of 15 amendments during the hearing, ranging from state-to-state -state commerce to organic food standards to rural broadband. Now, once the Farm Bill clears the House Ag Committee, it has to go to the full floor for a vote. That's likely to happen in May. On the Senate side... Farmers want a Farm Bill, number one, right. and they want it expedited, and they want us to get it right, and they want to have both uh, predictability and stability. So that's on us. I sat down recently with Senate Ag Committee Chairman Pat Roberts, and he says their side of the legislature has a very different dynamic. This is not a time for a revolutionary farm bill. I don't know about evolutionary, but mm -hmm. it's not revolutionary. Uh, it is a time for predictability. Farmers want to know what's going on. Their community bankers want to know they're in a tough spot. The Senate is yet to set a date for its markup or the farm bill process as a whole. But leaders from both sides say they're not interested in an extension. I know that there's a temptation among some to continue to kick the can down the road, to extend current law for short periods, to avoid 
hard, tough decisions. I believe an extension of the current farm bill is a really bad idea. You know, you get to pass the August recess and it gets tougher and tougher to get things done in Washington. So we got a bit of a time clock working on it. The U.S. dairy producers have until the end of this month to enroll in the new Dairy Margin Protection Program. Enrollment opened in April after USDA made changes to that program. Also from the dairy sector, the American Farm Bureau Federation announcing it's developed a new insurance policy for dairy farmers that protect against losses in revenue from milk sales. The new product offers several coverage levels based on the value of the farmer's milk. Farm Bureau says the majority of dairy farmers are paid based on the amount of milk, fat and protein. The new insurance policy is expected to be available later this summer. U.S. and China trade negotiators returned to the table today in Beijing. While there was no public statement following Thursday's meeting, analysts say it appears there was no breakthrough following that first round of talks. Chinese and U.S. officials are trying to defuse trade tensions between the world's two largest economies. Last month, China announcing it was considering tariffs on shipments of U.S. soybeans. Well, on Wednesday, a top executive with Bungie saying China has essentially stopped buying U.S. supplies ahead of any tariff implementation. Now, some economists saying that China imports have at least decreased, but there are different factors behind it. Historically, China imports little of U.S. soybeans this time of year. Most of the U.S. exports go to China the first couple of months of the marketing year, which begins September 1st. I don't know that any company in the right mind is going to sell a bunch of soybeans to China now on a delivered basis uh, when the potential that that shipment will get stopped. So I think you'd say that mostly it's come to a standstill for everybody uh, for now because buyers don't have to purchase now. They can buy later on if the tariffs don't go into effect and they'll know more about it later in the year. In the interim, they're buying everything they can get from South America. Mike Steenhook, executive director of the Soy Transportation Coalition, says there is certainly evidence of a decrease. However, he believes there's a difference of opinion, whether it's a dramatic pullback or if it's simply a reduction, which seems to happen during this time of marketing year. Another Wheat Quality Council hard red winter wheat tour is in the books, and this year's crop is stacking up to be one of the worst in the last few years. Scouts putting the final yield at 37 bushels per acre the lowest since 2015. Now last year, the crop average was 48 bushels to the acre, but with the crop so immature, it may be difficult for yields to make that mark. Mike Hoffman joining us now to look at crop comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Clinton. Crop comments will start in Indiana County, Pennsylvania. A NAS crop reporter says most of the fields have been too wet to get into. So far, some farmers have only been able to spread some lime. They were hoping to get ahead of field work this week. And in Kentucky, farmers are struggling with the wet and cool conditions so far this spring. As of Monday, just 15% of the state's corn crop had been planted. Five-year average is 35. And just 5% of winter wheat is headed. It's usually a third by now. Taking a look at the wind speed forecast, it's going to be fairly windy from eastern Iowa into the Great Lakes this morning. And you can see that will spread eastward into the southern Great Lakes by later today. Uh, tomorrow's not going to be quite as windy as many times this time of the year. Just a little bit in the morning in the northeast. And we'll see a little wind in the northern plains, northeast, and the southwest later in the day. But overall, not as much as normal. We'll have your forecast coming up. But first, here are some hometown temps. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. Cattle markets trying to climb a mountain of production. We'll get some direction on prices coming up next. And later, handling cover crops the wrong way can cost you at harvest. Details on Farm Journal College TV. Yeah. Um, With a uniquely powerful formulation of proven ingredients, Resicor <laughs> Corn Herbicide gives you extraordinary power. Who wants dessert? At least when it comes to weeds. In agribusiness, it was a mixed day for commodities, although wheat found more green. Let's get those details from the CME. The wheat market traded sharply higher here on Thursday. Both Chicago and Kansas City contracts posted sharp gains. The Kansas City futures came within a couple of cents of their March highs up around 565, so really a pretty strong performance. 
The Wheat Quality Council was out on their annual crop tour of HRW Wheat Country this week, and the findings were pretty much what we thought they would be. Uh, the crop was affected by drought in a lot of areas, and the yields are projected to be quite a bit lower than they had been in recent years. So some friendly headlines, but not necessarily unexpected headlines at this point. We've got global weather issues in, in multiple parts of the world, and that's usually what it takes to sustain a rally in the wheat, and uh, that's what we've seen here so far. The live cattle market traded sharply higher here on Thursday amid a very strong cash trade. Uh, cash cattle traded 126 in both Kansas and Texas. That would be above the 124 that was posted uh, earlier this week and last week, I believe. Again, Joe Beck with the CME Group here in Chicago. Here at the Agribusiness Desk, I have Chip Nellinger, Blue Reef Agri-Marketing. Chip, as we look at these cattle markets, uh, there's some dynamic things happening right now. What's catching your eye? Yeah, well, the, the biggest thing that, that jumps out, we finally have the April contract off the board. And uh, so June, um, you know, it's had the volume for a while, but yeah. now it's what everybody's going to be watching. And we're coming on nearly $20 under where the cash market is. Wow. Just finally Amazing. today, the June's caught fire a little bit, had a close over uh, 106, which has been really hard to get through. Uh, but that's the question. The, the cattle on feed reports for six or seven months have illustrated we've got bigger supplies coming. The market knows this. It's what's held us back a little bit. Right. But in the same breath, we've rallied, you know, box beef, 10 bucks in the last couple of weeks. The cash market's still strong. So this is a real battleground for them, wow. and nobody knows how that's going to play out, and it could lead to some really volatile trade. Well, that's interesting, especially as you look at the Southern Plains, where we have a lot of cattle. We've re rebuilt those inventories since 2011, and now we're dry again. Does it rain? Are we going to get summer pasture? And if not, where do those cattle go? Yeah, that's a, that's a logistics issue. Um, and it's unfortunate if you're in that area and, and you're facing that that decision, right? Do we Are we gonna have enough feed and forage and pasture? Or right. are we gonna have to, to liquidate some of this stuff? So that's unfortunate in, for those people, but that's usually just a logistics thing, that right. those cattle will move somewhere where there's yeah. uh, there's better uh, uh, forage and, and pasture and grass. Uh, but that plays into the equation as well. They've had their problems in the plains. Uh, it's really gonna be a, a wild card here. The demand's really good, and that's really yeah. what's helped keep it together. Uh, and, and we could maybe rally a little more, but I don't think producers should uh, get too bold up right now, especially if we do rally a few more dollars, because we do have to face those supplies that come later this summer. And uh, we just really have to be diligent to, to kind of manage risk out here, because you could still have some really big swings. Yeah, real quick, do you think futures and cash meet up? Well, the April finally did grudgingly. Um, I, I think it will, but now that June, you know, you still have a couple months left in the June. Right. So the question is, once we get into, um, you know, late May, the cash markets usually break. So the, the June's going to keep a little bit of a discount for that possibility and likelihood that we do see a break in cash prices. All right, good stuff, Chip. Appreciate you being here. We'll be back with more Ag Day in just a minute. Farming has changed. Markets are riskier than ever. For customized, focused commodity marketing, contact Chip Nellinger or Adam Dreyer at 309-550-7213. Plan for the unexpected with weather forecast updates. Local forecasts are delivered right to your cell phone each morning, making planning a little bit easier. Just text WEATHER6 to 31313 to get started. Welcome back to Ag Day, your meteorologist Mike Hoffman. As we look at the drought monitor, Mike, you can see that there is still a significant amount of drought long term. Some of these places have had rain, though. Yeah, they have, uh, but it doesn't seem to be helping in the long term drought. In fact, that exceptional area has expanded since four weeks ago. In fact, you look at the darkest red here and look uh, at the expansion of it from the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas back into the Four Corner region. Going back one month, not quite as much. It was already beginning, but as we've uh, seen over the past four weeks, week by week, that area has gotten a little bit worse. It has not gotten worse in the southeast, still dry though, southeastern Georgia in the parts of South Carolina. In fact, it's improved a little bit over the past couple of weeks, and it continues to slowly improve across the Dakotas in northeastern Montana. Here's the map this morning. You can see uh, showers uh, around most of the Great Lakes back in the eastern Iowa as well. We'll see uh, showers and thunderstorms kind of develop ahead of this cold front once again into the Ohio Valley, southern Mississippi Valley into uh, eastern and southern Texas. High pressure then builds in behind it. This is not Arctic air. It is Pacific air, which will mean pleasant conditions, not the real cold stuff that we've been seeing. One more system coming in to the far northwest as we head through uh, this afternoon by morning that will be spreading into uh, North Dakota. It doesn't have a lot of uh, moisture with it. 
but it can touch off, especially in the afternoons, a little bit of uh, shower activity. And we actually have a system coming out of the Bahamas. This is not expected to become tropical in nature, but it's going to have a fair amount of moisture with it. So central and south Florida, as we head into this weekend, going to end up getting some uh, decent showers and thunderstorms developing, especially each afternoon. There's a cold front by uh, late in the day tomorrow. You can see across the southeast with showers and storms, just spotty showers in the northern plains. There's a precipitation estimate over the past 24 hours from uh, south central Texas into uh, Missouri and also another area, Iowa, into the western Great Lakes, adding in the next 36 hours. Just kind of depends on where those thunderstorms pop up, but you can see we'll kind of spread things eastward, but not be as heavy as we have been over the past few days. This afternoon's temperature still 70s behind the front. That's what I'm talking about. That's not Arctic air, that's Pacific air. 58 though in the Sioux, but lots of 80s in the southeast. Low temperatures tomorrow morning going to be in the 50s across most of the Corn Belt. 60s by the time you get to the Gulf Coast. And the warmth continues, even expands a little bit in the Central Plains tomorrow afternoon. Take a look at the jet stream. You can see these little ripples, quick little shots of cooler air for the Great Lakes in the Northeast every couple of days. All in all, though, we're talking a west to east movement, and that'll keep things generally mild. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. First of all, for Helena, Montana, comfortable today. Clouds and some sunshine, high of 75. Shreveport, Louisiana, humid with thunderstorms likely, high of 78. And Canton, Ohio, mild today with a shower or thunderstorm, high around 74. Cover crops and the carbon penalty are the focus of our Farm Jewel and College TV lesson today. That's coming up next. And later, researchers find evidence growing up on a livestock operation may keep you healthy later in life. How you plant and terminate your cover crop can have a big impact on the crop you plan to harvest. Field agronomist Missy Bauer explains in today's Farm Journal College TV lesson. The uniformity of the stand of your cover crop is pretty important, especially if something happens like happened out here and it didn't get killed timely. Let me just show you this as an example. You see how thick the residue is here from where the cover crop was. A very thick density, thick stand, good establishment. But because this didn't get killed on time, you can see that it really affected the corn. Let me just bring you over here and show you an area where there wasn't a good stand of the cover crop. Now look at what the corn is doing here. The corn is very green in comparison. This is all part of that carbon penalty and trying to break down this residue that's actually here. So when you think about having cover crops flown on, and there maybe it's not as quite of a uniform stand in, in population or density throughout the field, you might see some of this variability out in your field itself. Okay? Again, this problem here is exaggerated because it was a really late kill on the cover crop. If this was killed when it was smaller, we wouldn't see this dramatic of an effect. But this is what the difference in stand density of your cover crop can do if it's not taken care of properly. When we come back, can growing up on a livestock farm help you keep healthy and less stressed later in life? Details after the break. In the Country, sponsored by Kubota. Tractors, hay tools, utility vehicles, mowers, and more. Visit KubotaUSA.com today. This weekend, I'm taking the kids' pigs to the county fair for tag-in, and no doubt there will be some stress getting them into the trailer. Stress in livestock's a combination that new research has found may have a long-term connection. The city folks at the LA Times reporting about a new study out of Germany and published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Now, the researchers recruited men under 40 who fit two distinct stories. One group having spent the years before they turned 15 in a city of more than 100,000 people and never had a pet in their home. Group two spent those early years on a livestock farm. Then the scientists set out to stress these guys using things like public speaking, answering jury and judge questions, or doing math. And they measured their responses right down to their body's chemical reactions. Turns out the guys from the farm stressed more but we're over it in about five minutes, while the city kids stressed a little less, but it lasted for more than two hours. The researchers say it helps confirm something called the hygiene theory, that growing up in a sanitized urban environment is 
making our immune or stress systems more fragile. There's something about being exposed to dirt, animals, and microbes early in life that teaches the body to handle these system stressors. Or maybe it's the stress of working with family as a kid, knowing you're never in the right place at the right time, even if that's where dad puts you. Stress or not, the work has to get done, so wish me luck. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. For Mike Hoffman and all of us here at AgDay, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.